Okay, hello everyone. When I say hello, I just don't mean you, I also mean everybody in cyberspace. Um, and uh, anywhere you are in the world, as I mentioned a number of times, I'm always very uh, intrigued by the people listening in New Zealand where now it's noon on Thursday of this week. Um, so welcome, and we will be talking about the power of introverts. I want to dedicate the class to sponsored by Judith Kirk, in memory of her brothers, Kalm and Mordechai ben David el Yohu, Benish Getzel ben David el Yohu, and her father, David el Yohu ben Avram Yitzchak, in honor of the birthdays of Yafa Rezel bas Tova and Davida Batsheva bas Yehudit Pro. Good. So, as a short introduction, this... Uh, I never liked the word class. I guess in my days in school, class always sounded very constricting and very like almost like a prison. We all liked when class ended. So I don't know what name to call this uh, gathering here, but let's call it an inter interaction. So it began before most of you were ever born, which is back in 1982, in the winter of 1982. At the time I was a, uh, obviously a younger man and I was um, working then in writing, in memorizing and writing and publishing the Lubavitcher Rebbe's talks. And the job entailed of uh, literally listening to and absorbing hours upon hours of talks delivered on Shabbat and holidays when no notes were taken and no recordings were made. So you had to use your good old mind to uh, retain the information. And then after Shabbos, and Yom Tov to write it down and publish for posterity. So there was a friend of mine that called me, his name uh, in Florida, and he said he has a businessman friend who's coming to New York and he's looking for some spiritual Jewish inspiration. The truth is I wasn't teaching then, I wasn't even interested in teaching. I was uh, busy all day with this work, which was very, very intense and very time consuming. But I couldn't say no, so uh, he came, a friend came, his friend came to see me in my office with another friend. They were business people. Sick. One was a promoter, actually boxing promoter. The other one was in theater. And we talked. We had this informal conversation without any real agenda. And, uh, and it was just, we hit it off, as they say. This conversation then continued. They asked if they could come back next week. It was Thursday night then because I couldn't work to it before Thursday night because my job didn't allow me to. And then they started coming on a weekly basis and bringing friends. There are many people from the music and entertainment industry. And it just started growing. It was all secular people, very spiritual, most Jewish, some not. But they did not have any traditional Jewish background. But there was, we had these fascinating conversations that went sometimes into the wee hours. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding, sometimes 4 or 5 a.m. even, all night. Um, yeah, I guess none of us had day jobs, you could say that. And, um, and this, this just continued, and more people started coming. This was all back in Brooklyn, in Crown Heights. And frankly, from 18, 1982 till today, in 2018, is how many, 36 years? 36 years. It never stopped. This class is, anyone sitting here, is a friend of a friend of a friend and a friend that you may never know, goes back 36 years ago. And then we moved the class to Wednesday night, in around, around the year uh, 1990, moved to the city because of the demands that people wanted me to come to the city. And around the same time, we started recording the classes. So the first eight years was basically not even recorded. Remember, this is all pre-internet, pre-email, the dinosaur age. You know, we used camels and donkeys to deliver the mail then. And um, I used a good old typewriter. It was the computer age began basically in the mid 80s, then fax machines. That you remember? You guys are old enough to remember? Okay, good. Um, Thanks for the compliment. <laughs> okay. Everything is relative. Everything is relative. Yeah. And, um, and then uh, I'm going to go through the whole history. It's fascinating. But literally, it's 36 years of an unbroken chain. I would say probably 30,000, 40,000 people came to this class over the years. At some point, we started a, a, an email list. And then after 1994, I wrote Toward a Meaningful Life, which some of you brought the book, which I'll sign later. Um, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. 
And the class has continued. I just feel one time to time I want to just remind myself and everyone where we came from. And the lessons learned, of course, is that you start something good, you just continue, you never know how far it will go. So maybe it's the longest running class on earth, Torah class. Maybe not. Um, and it was the people that came through these doors, and I wasn't always in this location, it was many different locations, have been literally diverse as the, the wide, as, ex, as extreme, along the entire spectrum and cross-section of population. Literally. You never believe the types of people. And I uh, thank God I've made, I can remain contact. There are people sometimes walk in here Wednesday night I haven't seen in 20 years. I'm not exaggerating. But I remember them. They remember me. And uh, when you make a spiritual connection, it, uh, it lasts because it's not uh, built on just a temporary benefit. It's built on ideas that are timeless and addressing uh, the universal concerns of the human condition based on the timeless teachings of the Torah. Now, I should mention, some of you know what the word Torah is. Some people that came here never knew what the word Torah is. I didn't always use that word simply because it was an alien word to many people. But I, I mention it because it's just to give you the context of the whole thing. So here we are, 2018, continuing. Today, more people listen online than they do that they come here as part of the world of technology. So... Um, and one common thread through all these classes have been taking a theme that addresses, as I said, people's personal lives, um, our personal challenges, our personal issues, and finding the wisdom, the universal wisdom of Torah that can apply itself to those ideas and challenges. Because to me, that's the greatest um, challenge we have today. Whether someone's Jewish and is affiliated and is uh, observant, and is uh, connected in some way or another, even a person like that, often Judaism can be something that you do culturally. You're born into a family or a home where that was the culture. It's not necessarily a spiritual choice that you made in your life. It's this is what you grew up with. Not to say that's a bad thing, but often it's not necessarily something that you worked on or you chose. And therefore, many, many people, and I know this from personal experience and many, all my, through my journeys in life, many people, for them, Judaism often becomes something very mechanical. Just showing my phone. Just in case. Yeah. Many mechanical, we'll call it mechanical Judaism. If you want the Hebrew for it, it's called mitzvah sanoshim elamada. It means robotic. You do it, you know, you wake up in the morning, there's the prayers, there's the different customs and rituals that we go through. Passover rituals, Purim rituals, Hanukkah rituals, different holidays, Shabbos, and so on. And you end up being more or less a mechanical Jew. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, but it means you're following through a culture and a, a ritualistic culture that doesn't necessarily have what we'll call vitality. It's not necessarily passionate, exciting. So what happens with a Jew that grew up in, in the system in that fashion? Many things could happen. One thing could happen is that you remain that robot and you perpetuate whatever was given to you, and you build your family, and the mechanical Judaism continues on. It's one scenario. Another scenario is you live a double life. You're a mechanical Jew on the outside, and the inner side, inside life, you do other things that are not necessarily consistent. Another option is you just leave the whole thing, because it doesn't mean anything to you. It's not relevant. You're not just going to do it by, by rote, just because your parents did it, or because you're going to break your mother, grandmother or grandmother's heart. And then there are, of course, variations of all of that. Some people do go on a deeper journey, and they do find a deeper connection to their Judaism that's more than just cultural and mechanical. But if you th go through all the different things I just said, one thing, well, the key word that is the key operative word that's missing is the word relevance. Relevance. If someone asks you, what are the three top things that are most important in your life, I would say that most religion from Jews would not necessarily say Judaism. They may say money, they may say power, they may say bring up a good family, but not necessarily mitzvahs or even study of Torah. Some may, some may not. If you ask how many people do you do, how many people turn? You know, there are people who sit and listen to every word of the reading of the Torah on Shabbat, Shabbos. You know, they even correct the reader of the Torah. There are people who are professionals, correctors. And, um, and they listen every word. They don't want to miss a word. And they follow every le iota of a mitzvah, and every hidr, every detail. And then, if they have a psychological issue in their lives, let's say shalom bias issue, the difficulties between husband and wife, or challenges with their children, 
or internal challenges, their own challenges, which is addictions, different temptations and seductions, or challenges like fears, inhibitions, insecurities, the things that people go to therapy for, things that people come from childhood, trauma, abuse, etc. I would want to know how many people do you think that are religious Jews that listen to every word of the Torah open up a Torah to try to find an answer there. I don't think I could count five people that I know that would do that. They wouldn't know how to find an answer in the Torah. Where in the Bible are you going to find an answer? In the story of which story exactly? You know? And even if you open up a Talmud and you find Torah Shabbat the oral Torah, and all its interpretations, you might find some inspiration. And there may be tremendous lessons. But to say that that's the go-to book that you would go to to deal with personal challenges, most Jews would not answer that way. They'd say, I think, some would say, they believe it's in the Torah, but I don't know how to find it. Some would say, I don't even think it's in the Torah. Where do you go then? Well, the first place everybody goes into a thing called denial. You avoid the issue altogether. When you can't deny anymore, the next place you go is to a therapist. And they try to find help there. Um, but very few people are going to say, you know what, I'm going to learn more Torah, and that way I'll become a better husband or a better wife or a better father or mother or deal with my inner uh, demons and so on. This is what we call dissonance. It means the Torah exists in your life, and it's important to you, and you'll die for it. And you'll, uh, you will not eat a shred of uh, chometz on Pesach, and you will not, on Shabbos, be very careful. But there's a dissonance because it's disconnected from your personal life. What I mean by that, not that you personally don't do these things, but you, but you don't necessarily see how Shabbos or, or a holiday or a different mitzvah is, helps you heal and grow as an individual and get more empowered and more actualized. And that's why you find actualization elsewhere, because you don't see it in the Judaism. What do you think is being created? a dichotomy of two worlds. One is your Jewish life and one is your personal life. Now, when you take into account the majority of the Jewish people today, um, which are not observant, you could imagine the dissonance is even greater because they don't even know what the Torah is in the first place. They're not even doing mechanical mitzvahs because they don't do any mitzvahs because they're not familiar with it. And it's not a critique. It's just the reality where they were born. They were born into homes and families that were assimilated. So however you twist and turn it, making an, a teaching how the Torah's wisdom and, and Judaism is relevant to our personal lives is a necessity, not an option, a necessity to make it vita the, the vitality that you feel uh, the passion and the excitement. Just as excited and passionate you are about things that are close to your heart, that you can see that in Torah you find that message and that lesson. Maybe one flight up. There's a lot happening in this building tonight, huh? Okay. You're welcome to be here, but I think the party you were looking for is upstairs. <laughs> okay. So I know this is a rather, uh, I usually don't do this longer introduction, but I just felt I should. And, um, and that has been the theme. There are many, many classes you can go to in Manhattan, in the city, all over the world, frankly. I've, you know, classes, Bible classes, Talmud classes, Halacha classes, history. What I try to focus on is this key word, which is relevance, personal relevance. Because I believe, not just I believe, it makes sense, that when you find that message and you learn a lesson from Abraham, or from Isaac and Jacob, or from Sarah Rivka Rachaleah, or from Moses, or from the stories that we're reading now in the Torah chapters. And you see, wow, that has a personal message to the struggles I'm dealing with today, not just to events that happened thousands of years ago and, and, uh, and more uh, global, or I would say more uh, general, generic ideas, but rather personal, personal lesson of my life. That changes everything. So that's been the focus through all the years, different through its, all these uh, transmigrations and the metamorphoses of this class. So this is somewhat of a background that it's always, as I said, from time to time, I like to remind myself and everyone about where we come from. But that said, let me go to the topic at hand. So, um, so those ideas, as I said, originate from 
the universal literature of Torah, which includes a very large body. However, I speak about it in a language that really anyone can understand, so um, it's not prohibited to someone that knows Hebrew or knows even what a parsha is or other uh, such Jewish references. I'll just share a short story which just captures the power of that. In those early years when I gave the class, I remember, I've told this story many times, but it's always worthwhile repeating, and that is I remember the people coming were, as I said, very secular, very spiritual, but their spirituality, they would say, would, came not from traditional Jewish sources. It came from um, things like Zen Buddhism, something called LSD, which probably none of you ever heard of. I've heard of it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you don't have to tell us more than that. No. Okay. Anyway, it was a very popular, um, called psychedelic. Uh, no, I never no? Well, you didn't have the guts? What happened? Guts? That, that's exactly what they use to try and get you to take it. Oh. And if you really have bad karma, you'll have a bad trip. And everyone I saw screaming and yelling and in pain said they had a good trip. No, I don't touch it. I never touched it. Okay. But I have experience with people that did. Okay, so do I. <laughs> Um, um, I never touched it either, but I met many people that did, for good or for bad. Bottom line, my point is not so much talking about uh, acid trips, but rather about uh, the story that I want to share. So I realized that the people coming to the class were people who had very different background than I did. And just by sitting there with a beard and a yarmulke, it was a blacker beard then, um, what could be a, uh, it was not neutral. I was definitely projecting a certain image, and I didn't know. I felt I was like at a disadvantage that before I even opened my mouth, I, uh, could be, they could be judging me or stereotyping me. You know, I may be reminding one guy of an angry grandfather that schlepped him to synagogue in Yom Kippur against his will, or remind someone else of an irrelevant Hebrew school teacher that taught them holly, hollow uh, bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah lessons, or maybe even good memories. So I just felt very, uh, I felt in that sense, like not knowing who I'm speaking to. So I decided, you know what, I'm gonna try an experiment to so-called to dispel the stereotypes and the preconceived notions people may have about uh, someone that looks like me. I decided to experiment that I'm gonna speak a language that is completely devoid of anything religious. No Torah words, no religious words, no Hebrew words, not even the word God. And I came up with this whole language, and I said, let's see what happens. So instead of the word God, I used words like the essence of reality, or the higher reality. Or for a particularly new age group, I used words like undefined layers of unconscious energy, or something like that. And instead of Torah, I used words like blueprint, or roadmap. And instead of mitzvahs, I used the word connections. And instead of Mashiach and Geula and redemption, I used the word destination. And here I was waxing eloquent and pontificating on this journey to reach the essence of it all, using these, following the blueprint, using these connections, till we come to a point of fusion when matter and spirit, matter and energy and form and function and the inner and outer are totally seamlessly bound together in one beautiful cosmic symphony. That was the way I was speaking. And the people were like, I remember they were sitting, they were like, I had their entire attention, they were like mesmerized, I would say. Anyway, a few weeks go by, and a fellow comes over to me, he was a uh, singer in a band called, a rock and roll band called Jay and the Americans. They were a big band in the 60s, you know, a best-selling band. Hit a lot of hot hits, hot to hit singles. And he was a singer in the group. He comes over to me and says to me, are you talking about God? You know, after all these weeks, he wanted to know what I was talking about. So I said, yes, but shh, don't spoil it for the others. That's what I told him. And the experiment worked better than I ever expected because by not using any loaded words, I was able to convey a message that they had no preconceived notions about. And we talked completely this English language of the inner meaning of it all without any labels that, some can, that can be misinterpreted. It's a tremendous lesson in good communication that's not the words you use, it's what the words mean. 
And the, you may think you mean one thing with the word, but when I hear the word, I may have a very different meaning, the, the, the definition of that meaning. It's like Levi Yitzchak Baditchever, the, the Baditchever Rebbe, once said to a self-proclaimed atheist, the God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. So before we talk about belief in God, I believe or don't believe, you have to first define your terms. Maybe the God that someone says to you, God is a man with a long white beard sitting on a throne in heaven waiting to strike us with lightning when we misbehave. If you told me that's your definition, I may tell you I'm also an atheist. I also don't believe in that God. So it all comes down to terms. And you'll find so many arguments around ideas that you never establish your axioms because every discussion needs axioms. You need to first, what do you mean when you say the word God or no God? What do you mean when you say the word Torah? What is a mitzvah? Mean? And these things are taken for granted by people who whenever, whatever upbringing or culture they come with, they think my culture, I know what, what it means. But there are other cultures and there are other conceptions and there are other opinions. And there are people who have very different perception than you have. This is the art of real communication and the art of really being able to understand an idea that transcends your particular narrow uh, view on things. Because everybody has their ghetto, everybody has their perception of things, everyone has their perspective. And to understand perspective, you, to really understand intelligently, you need to know there's other perspectives. This doesn't mean yours is wrong. But you need to be open to realize that someone may have a very different view than you do on these ideas. So again, this is somewhat of an introduction, but I will go to the topic because at the end of the day, I need to address the topic. And that is the power of introverts. But I will address it also. I will show you where I get the ideas from in the context of what I've said till now. But let me move over. I'm going to move over now to languages that is not as uh, Torah dicks. Let's put it this way. So there's the concept of introvert, extrovert. Everybody's intrigued by this because you know why? You always want to know, am I an introvert or am I an extrovert? And I mean, there's a very shallow or superficial definition of introvert, extrovert, which goes like this. Introverts are people who like to be alone. They prefer alone than being with others. An extrovert like, loves the, is a party person, likes other people. And that's one interpretation. Other people like say introverts are very introspective. They're sometimes more morose, more, I want to say depressed, they're more, they're more serious, more intense. An extrovert is far more light, light spirited. I mean, they're all interconnected. This is, this is the usual conventional definition. I'm not saying they're even accurate definitions, but again, like I just said with language, before you talk about introvert, extrovert, you have to know what you're talking about. If I say introvert, someone may say that means something else to me. But the question that people have is okay, so which type am I? You know, is it true that you can just say the criteria is that when you go, do you like to go to a party or would you rather stay alone by yourself? your friends say we're going out, would you say, you know what, take a rain check and you don't prefer. Even if you don't go, do go to a party, you're not going to meet people, you're going more for the experience or for something else. These are all questions that we ask and even if we come to an answer and say, you know what, I think I'm more introverted or I'm more extroverted, the next question is, is this, by, is this nurture or nature? Were you born that way or you became that way? In other words, did you grow up in a home where perhaps that was the attitude of your parents. So it wasn't necessarily you're born with it, it's not genetic, but it's, excuse me, the culture that you're around. So often we copy what we see. You know, where we learn, we assume what we consume, as they say. So that means that what you see and what you experience around you becomes your model. Like where do we learn about love? Where do we learn about coping mechanisms? How do we learn to interact with each other? The first place we learn as children, impressionable children, is from our parents. So if they communicate well, it's usually a good sign you will be a good communicator. If they communicate badly, I mean they yell at each other or they don't know how to communicate or silent treatment or passive aggressive behavior or aggressive behavior or other forms, this often becomes our first template that we experience and very often that becomes our only template. I mean, as you grow older, you hopefully can think openly and say, you know what, maybe this isn't the best way, etc. I don't want to go so much into that. I'm talking about the extrovert. Introvert is often very much nurtured versus nature. But there's also nature. Some people genetically and uh, by her hereditarily just simply assume, simply inherit a certain personality, a certain disposition that's more uh, introverted. Some people say introversion is connected with being shy. A shy person is an introverted person. Others will say that's not correct at all. A shy person doesn't necessarily mean introvert. You can be shy and, not, and be an extrovert. You can be shy because for whatever reason, when you were younger, you may be embarrassed. 
Maybe you're a very sensitive person. That doesn't make you an introvert. It just means that you may be shy until you get over it. Then there are people that are fundamentally shy. So the list goes on. And I'm obviously not going to exhaust every possible scenario. I want to address a certain theme here. But I do want to talk about it somewhat comprehensively because there are many different ways to look at it. And why is it so relevant to us? Even though maybe it's, 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 uh, it's, it doesn't have to be stated because it's pretty clear. Because the more you know, you know yourself, the more you can grow. The more you can figure out, is this something healthy about me? Is this unhealthy? Is it something I should try to overcome? Or something I should embrace? You know, know thyself is one of the first steps in really becoming an independent individual. Because you definitely don't want to become like someone else. You don't want to re- spend the rest of your life trying to be someone else. You want to be yourself. So you want to say to yourself, okay, so I want to know what am I like? And this makes a big difference because then you can focus. If you, for example, identify that you're a real natural introvert, there's no reason to fight City Hall, so to speak, and suddenly try to be someone else. However, there is a, there is a perception in society today that introverts are inferior to extroverts. That is the extroverts that are going to succeed in life because they are go-getters. They go out there, they meet people, they network, they like that whole uh, human interaction. And an introvert's going to get hurt more because of their internal nature, and people don't understand them necessarily, they, they don't always speak up for themselves, not because they're not good people, that they will be at a disadvantage, especially in a society like ours, where we live, where, where it's defined by, by aggression. You know, if you want a job, you've got to go get it. You have to compete with others. You're at a, a job where there's a lot of people working, you want to show your boss that you're better than your peers. You want to get an, a raise, you want to get a promotion. So we live in a capitalistic society that is definitely built on that type of comp- competitiveness. And often we become someone we're not even want to be. Often we become a lot more aggressive than we really naturally are. You know, I, I, remember, I remember many, many times, I remember after 9-11, a particular story about an about individual. It's a long story, I'm not going to go through the details, but somebody basically was killed in the World Trade Center. <clears throat> And he had a friend, they were in school together, but that friend was always resentful of him because he had this office in, uh, what was it, Cantor Fitzgerald was one of the big yeah. firms where so many people died that, that tragic morning. And he had an office in some little dingy place a few blocks away, and he was always jealous of his friend who had this, 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 this scenic, these, uh, what do they call them, the bay windows. That you saw the whole Hudson River, and you could see like halfway through America or something. And he was in this little office, and then that morning, his friend was killed. And he remembers how his whole life was driven by his jealousy. He was so jealous of him. Came to realize that, you know, he became someone who he wasn't. He says, we were such close friends. Not that he blamed himself for anything that happened, but it was just his own feeling. He realized, you know, when someone dies and so tragically dies, you suddenly realize where are your priorities. So we sometimes become people we're not even meant to be or we don't even like because of the forces of the marketplace and of economic pressures and other things. So all this comes into play in looking at yourself. Who am I and what am I like? And this is something that, as I said, I talk about almost on a weekly basis, just different aspects of it. So this introvert, extrovert, the first thing you need to do is define what it means. And is it true? Is it true to say that an introvert is at a disadvantage and inferior to an extrovert? As a matter of fact, in the, in the DMV, um, what was it called? Um, no, not the DMV. No, no, no. The American Psychiatric Association has a uh, manual, the DSM. I said DV. What did I say? The Department more. I was thinking about it. I'm thinking about a, a ticket I have to pay. No, not DMV. What did I say? DSM. Right. The DSM manual, which classifies um, all the mental illnesses. So they actually, until to, until 2010, they considered the person, the introverted personality, as a defect. Can you imagine? They consider it as a defect in the in in, in a, it's a disorder. They've changed that, but till 2010, just talking about eight years ago. So that's the extent how society sometimes seems sees and misunderstands introverts. I remember, like everybody, I'm sure remembers, I had classmates in my class when I was a kid. I remember one particular guy who was so very quiet. It would be like the classic introvert, and everybody thought including my, the teacher, that he was a stupid guy. Because whenever any time, any challenge or any, any particular uh, question was raised, he was always quiet. 
teacher looked to him. He was too shy to speak. I got to know him over the, the years. We went to elementary school together. And I came to realize the guy is brilliant. He's probably the smartest guy in the class. I mean, he had later he had many challenges in his life as we went to high school and so on. But he was the smartest guy in the class, no question about it. He was just a very, very internal, very what we call in uh, Hasidic language, primiyazdik. He was an internal person. He was a very um, quality person. And he was a kid. I mean, we were children, so it wasn't like developed and matured yet. But he was a person, had not other circumstances in his life come in the way, would have been unbelievable. You know, really sincere, gentle, very sensitive person. Really understood other people. He had a deep empathy. And if you really get to know him, you start saying, is this guy, what, what is he exactly? Now, is he an introvert? As I said, I still haven't defined even the word in a way that's acceptable to all of us. But he definitely appeared like an introvert because he would not go out. He was not interested in parties. He wasn't interested in people. Was even, you know, in the beginning, he wouldn't even show friendship. You know, I didn't have to pull teeth because he did have what to say. But we became very friendly. And uh, you know, I recently met him even years later. As I said, he had the other things that got into the way of his life. But, but it was a classic. I remember the misunderstanding of a child that can be the, the best kid in the class, but nobody understands the person because, you know, we like cookie cutter model. You like the popular kid everyone likes. When necessarily, there's not necessarily the best person in the room. Now, he wasn't bullied, thank God, so it wasn't that, he didn't have that problem. But sometimes these type of children are also bullied because they're, they seem vulnerable and they seem, uh, you know, you can pick on them. The point is that so much of our lives as children, as we grow up, is so defined by how others see us in this context, our social status, and how popular we are, and how outgoing we are, how not outgoing we are. And very often, the introverts get the brunt of the criticism as being, oh, he's a loner. He's a, he's a brood, he likes to brood, he or she. So this is a really a, a tremendous, uh, it's, a, a, a tremendous it's a critical aspect to our personality and our lives to address this topic. So, what, how, so how do we look at this? So here's the interesting point. So, and I'm taking what I'm saying now from primarily from uh, mystical teachings, Kabbalistic and Hasidic teachings. And I'm not going to I'm not going to quote exact sources right now, but it's coming from that place, talking about what really defines a human being. Okay, what defines a human being? Are we, as I said, are we really wired that way? Some of us are wired extroverts, and some of us are introverts. Is it something like I said before? We assume through nurture, through education, through influences around us, or there's something more going on? And the answer is there is absolutely more going on. Because you can't answer the question, are you an introvert or extrovert, if you don't first answer a bigger question, which is, what makes us tick? Who is the human being? Before we start classifying and labeling people, you know, you're extra, extrovert, you're introvert, let's define who are you, who, what do we know for sure about a person? And here, we get into a very interesting um, analysis. Because if you go by the terms of modern psychology, which is really around 100 years old, a little more, 110, 120 years old, Freud, Sigmund Freud, the good Jew, the good Jewish mother, is considered the father of modern psychology. Today, absolutely, there are many who do not have wandered, who have definitely digressed from his approach and actually adamantly disagreed with his approach. But he's still the guy to disagree with. He's still Freud. You still always hear his name. He's the guy that you don't agree with. So you have the different schools of thought, whether it was Jung or Adler or others or uh, Viktor Frankl. You know. um, my point that I'm really making here is not to get into the comparison of different psychological models, but rather just to tell you, modern psychology is only a few hundred, is 100 years old. It's not a long time. So you can imagine it's in its infancy, really. I mean, there's some that even say psychology is not even a real science. Some say in comparison to true medicine or true mathematics, the real physical sciences, they'll call psychology quack, quack medicine. Yeah, it's called that. Check it out on Wikipedia. On the other hand, the fact of the matter is there are psychiatrists, there are psychologists, there are therapists and social workers, and they probably outnumber medical doctors. You know, no one even knows the numbers but it's definitely in the millions. Some people say there are more psychotherapists than there are clients in the world today. And others insightfully say that every therapist should be a client, or maybe is. That's where they go into therapy, because they need help themselves. 
Well, however you twist and turn it, the bottom line is psychology is not some type of uh, tangential and uh, marginal uh, uh, factor in life. It's absolutely very much part of our culture. And today it's like people are even proud. They say, you know, here's my dentist, my doctor, my therapist. It goes like, you know, my accountant, my lawyer. It's on there. Some people even have it on their business card. I never saw that. That's a little, it's meant to be a joke. Yeah. Okay. You're allowed to laugh, by the way, in this class. There's no need to uh, control yourself. Um, just for the record. I don't know, you know, maybe think that you have to be reverent. Um, right, Mesh? Is that true? Okay. Good. Laughter. So, my point is then, so then where do we turn to if you want to ask the question, who are you? What makes you tick? I always mention this because it happens to be true, as, as ridiculous as it is. You ask most people, who are you? They actually give you their business card. I've tested this. And when you say to them, but this is what you do. This is not who you are. They say, oh, good point. Okay. What does that tell you? That most people never think about who they are. They're more involved with what they do than who they are. What do you mean what they do? Their job. Because that's what preoccupies your life. When you're younger, officially, and you should have the time to be exploring who you are. But once you get into the rat race and the merry go of life, the roller coaster, and you have to pay bills, and you have responsibility, and you have a family to take care of, like many will say, I don't have the luxury to ask who I am. I don't, you know, I don't have time. I have to, I have to pay, I have to get my, I have to make ends meet. So basically what you do controls who you are. And the who you are goes undercover with statistics showing that most people don't even like their jobs. So not only is you who you, what you do is not who you are, it's actually contradictory to who you are. So you'll say to somebody, if it's not who you are, why are you doing this? You say, I need to pay my bills. This job came my way. If it was up to my dreams and my ideals, I would never be doing this. Yeah, how many people will say that? Many. Then there are people who come to terms and say, you know what? I didn't like this job, but this is what I do. And I learned to love it. Or I learned to tolerate it. I learned to accept it. And then there's the rare few that will say, I make a, part, no, I make a livelihood from the thing I love. It's a labor of love. I actually do the thing that is closest to my heart and soul. But that's a very small part of the population. How that works, you know. And again, it's not the topic I want to talk about, I'm just talk talking about it because the issue of who you are is not really um, a prominent question that children are forced to ask. So we go through school, we learn a lot about the tools of life, how to do things. So you come away in the best scenario with an excellent education, so you have an excellent tool chest. But if someone asks you, so who are you? You say, well, you know, I know they never, I never took that course. You know? Now, some of us figure it out due to our own life experiences or our parents are good influences in that way. But some of us, I know people, PhDs in, in, in any, un, everything under the sun, and they have no clue who they are. They have no clue about what really makes themselves tick. They, they're very knowledgeable. Uh, Oscar Wilde put it, put it this way. You know, there are people who know the price of everything but the value of nothing. Or another way to put it is the, you know more and more about less and less. So just to have a lot of knowledge doesn't necessarily mean you know qualitatively about life. You just know a lot of quantity, you know, a lot of information. You know, computers today have much more data than any mind does. That doesn't make a computer self-aware. So knowledge is not a, is not a, is not a guarantee that is going to make you self-aware. So psychology is meant to address some of that. Psychology is, a, is a, rooted in the Latin term psych and ology, which means study of the soul. Logi is the study, and psyche is the Latin or Greek word for soul. So it's the study of the soul. Not necessarily the religious context soul, but soul meaning not what you do, but who you are. And here you're going to go through, uh, literally, if you go through the psychological models, literally from one end of the spectrum to the next. Freud, mentioning him again, would say that the core of a human being is what he calls the, in German the id. The id is a, uh, the core raw you is raw pleasure, sexual pleasure. Whatever, I, me, me, me. That's what it is. But it's regulated by the ego and the superego. So therefore, we become socially uh, proper to coexist with each other. 
But if push comes to shove, if you were to cut through all the layers, a human being is a selfish narcissist. This is Freud's analysis of the human being. You go to the other extreme, Viktor Frankl, for instance, will say no. Man's search for meaning, logotherapy. He will say the core of a human being is the search for meaning. With all the different evidence he has, and he was in the, in the camps during the Holocaust and, and, and demonstrated how people who had meaning in their lives were able to survive even the harshest situations because they had something transcendent. Young also, much more spiritual than compared to the raw, um, let's call it materialistic view of Freud. Not to say that Freud's view is not sophisticated, but it defines a human being in a, very, in, a very way, in a very defined way. So then you ask yourself the question, so well, how do we come to the conclusion? What is the human being? Who's the human being? Who am I? Am I at heart a narcissist and a selfish person? As is proven, for example, in scenarios where people get caught trapped in an avalanche. Or you see in times during the, during the Holocaust, when you're tortured, how people turn on each other. Very fine, good people could suddenly, suddenly become cannibalistic and actually kill somebody because they're so hungry. They'll kill the weak one. You have, you have scenarios like this. And you ask yourself a question, God forbid no one should ever be in this situation. What would you do if you were desperate? Would you turn your friends in if you could save your own skin, as some of the capos and did in during the Holocaust? Would you stoop to a level that is beyond human, below human, in order to, for your own survival. So some psychologists say, you know, when we're in the regular situation, most of us have an etiquette and a certain proper behavior, but put somebody in extreme circumstances where they're tortured or they're starving from hunger or there's a gun to their head or they're trying to save their own lives, they can suddenly become monsters and animals and turn on each other. Everybody read Lord of the Flies which was a study of children in that circumstance, what they can do to each other, the cruelty. So you can make a very strong case that at the heart, the soul of who a human being is, is very ugly. And we just have layers of, uh, it's packaged nicely on the outer layers. Or we have the opposite scenarios. You have people who in the harshest circumstances became the most noble, Let, died before they would turn someone else in, sacrificed their lives for even a stranger. Gave someone else the bread to eat before they would eat it, even though they died because of it. So you can see human beings rising to even higher than angelic heights. So which one are we, the angel or the, the devil at heart? So here I turn to a psychology that's longer than 110 years old or 100 years old. We'll call it the psychology, universal psychology of uh, Torah or Judaism. And not only for Jews, for all people. And what does the Bible state right in the beginning? Man, the human being, was created in the divine image. It's the first statement about a human being. The first, first. Nothing comes before that. Not intelligent creature, not an emotional creature, not a sexual creature. A creature created in the divine image. Which right away gives you like a piece of God. An image of God. Then in the next chapter, we read another expression which is called Yetzir Leva Adam Ramin Urav that the yetzer, the inclination of a person, is evil from childhood. This is the root for the word yetzer hara. So we have another voice inside of us that is selfish and narcissistic, and it's me, 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 as opposed to, instead of giving, taking. Selfish instead of selfless. So which one are we? If you read the Bible literally, it would appear that we're really the divine image, and then we have another voice, because that's the order. But you could easily argue, and this is the way it's argued, this is actually the whole Tanya is based on this, from Rabbi Shneir Zaman of Liadi, and other, this, uh, the other texts that talk about this, which is really based on what's called the Shari Gedusha, the gates of Kedusha of holiness from Rabbi Chaim Vital, the great student of the Holy Arizal. So this goes back now 500 years, where he writes that every person has two souls. So every person has two voices. One is the divine and one is the animal. One is selfish and driven by survival. The other one is driven by transcendence. One voice is take care of myself. The other one is to change the world in some way. To bring light and warmth to others. You get the idea. So we could say then that the identity of a human being is, is like two voices. 
And they're in struggle. They struggle. They're in battle with each other. Like Yaakov and Esau, Jacob and Esau. From the mother's womb, they always struggle. As the Torah says, they were two nations that she carried, two archetypes. One the warrior and one the scholar. I'm intentionally using that expression. So now, once you get to that place, you say, okay, so what that makes us tick? Makes us tick is that we have a soul inside of us. We actually have two. And one of them is driven by survival and one's own needs. And the other one is driven by a higher purpose. And we see this all the time. Who doesn't have this struggle? Every one of us has. Every minute of our lives. Am I going to do something for me? Or am I going to do something for someone else? Am I going to indulge? Or am I going to be more uh, sensitive? And it permeates every aspect, every choice we make in our lives. It lies at the heart of relationships. You have a partner. You have a spouse. Is it all about me, 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 and my spouse is here to serve me? Or is this a mutual partnership? Give and take. And there's a humility. And there's a giving. You're not just here to give, take. There's a selflessness. Relationships that have one or the other are not going to work, function well. They'll be dysfunctional. So you need to have, definitely have to take care of yourself because you have an identity, but you also have to, you're in a relationship with someone else. It's not just about you. It, you can put it the way Hillel said. It may not nearly me, if I'm only for myself, if, if I won't be for myself, what am I? And the other side of it, if I'm only for myself, what am I? So which one is it? It sounds contradictory when you first read it. But the answer is not contradictory because we need two things. We need an identity. We need an independent individual identity. That's healthy to have. But you don't have an individual identity at the expense of everything else. And the simple analogy for this is when you look around, look at everything in nature. Look at your own human healthy body. You see it all the time. Look at the human body. You have a mind, you have a heart, you have different organs, lungs, liver, kidneys. I'm just missing a few, listing a few. Millions of different pieces. Are they individuals or are they team players? The answer is both. If they're not going to do what they have to do, then you will have destruction. If they only do what they have to do and they don't interact with anything else in your body, there will also be destruction. So the best example is like a symphony. A symphony, an orchestra. You can have 100 instruments, 100 musicians playing different instruments. They each know when to play their, it comes their turn, but they also then defer to the next step. And that's what makes it beautiful. We call that harmony within diversity. So it's not single singularity of one single cell or one single unit. Everyone is an individual, but every individual is aware that it complements and is complemented by the others. And yes, it sounds like paradox, a paradox, but that's the only way true healthy f organisms work. This, this paradox of individual balanced with others. Exactly like Hill said, if I'm, only for, if I, if I'm not going to be for myself, if you're not going to do your job and say, you what, I'm just relying on the crowd or everyone else, that's not, no. You need to do what you have to do. The mind cannot be the heart. The heart can't be the, the liver. On the other hand, they each defer, they each see to or yield to the others as they all interact with each other. So in essence, you really need the two souls. Because even the animal soul is not a bad thing. It's fine to be, you know, to take care of your own needs. We have the concept, my life comes first. You have to take care of your own needs. You can't just be a selfless creature that doesn't think about yourself and only about others. That's not, that's not healthy either. But you can't think only about yourself. That's the point. It has to be a balance. And now let's take it to the extrovert and introvert issue. I mentioned Jacob and Esau, the twins. If you, on a surface level, it would seem that Esau is the extrovert and Yaakov is the introvert. Very simply, the verse comes that they grew up and one was Ishtam Yeshiva Halim. Jacob meant the innocent, simple, Tom, sincere one, the one that sat in the tents, he was a, he was a, a scholar. Very introverted life. He sat with the books. The other is described, Esav, Ish Mochama Yedetzayed, a warrior who was a hunter. He mastered the hunt. 
That is a go, that's a go-getter. That's a hunter. That's a warrior. If you think of it in terms of a society today, you know, you have people who are more of the scholars, the introspective ones, the ones that are behind library walls, in academia. And then you have the, 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 the go-getters, the aggressive business people who build things and go, and go out there. They're the hunters. They're the warriors. Which one are you and I? The answer is we're both. We should be both. Because not one is not, they both are necessary in life. So you'll say, one second, isn't Ace of the bad guy and we want to eliminate him? No, that's not true. We don't want to eliminate him. We want him to balance him. You see, the end of the story is Jacob and Esau do reconcile. And not only that, it says at the end of days they will, they will work side by side. Why? Because you need to have two sides. To you. you need to be a person who's a, who goes out to get things. You can't just sit inside your own, your own little castle. And on the other hand, you can't just be a person who's just an extrovert, you have to have introvert, you have to have introspective time. So if you really ask someone, if you really, I should rephrase that, if you really want to define what makes a healthy person, a healthy person has moments when they're there with themselves, and there's times where they're act interacting with others. Anyone that has one extreme or the other, something's problematic. So then the question is, so then are there such a thing as an introvert, extrovert, objectively? Healthy introvert, extrovert? Yes, there could be a primary, so-called a primary disposition, predisposition, that some people lean more toward the introvertive, others lean more toward the extrovert. But everybody needs both. Think about it. Let's say the person who's the warrior, the person who's out there, loves to be with people, is a social animal, party animal, loves to party. To do that 24-7, does that make sense? That person also has to sleep, no matter how many uh, acid trips they are on or how many other things that keep them awake. They have to sleep. They have to have some downtime for themselves. And if they don't, it's not healthy. Can you imagine somebody that's constantly on that, uh, on that uh, what's the word I want to use? On that uh, merry-go-round. It's always partying, always social, also always extrovert. You always, we all need moments where we have to stop, pause, and say, OK, where I stand, introspection, a little accountability. On the other hand, the person who's complete introspective and stays there is, is what Hillel says. So is, you stay only for yourself, only an introvert, you're not going to be complete. We all need others, first of all, to complement us. Nobody is an island unto themselves. We need support. We need friends. We need companionship. I mentioned before relationships. A human being, a relationship, a marriage, is not just an optional nice idea. It's actually a necessity. We need a companionship in this world. One of the most painful, saddest things is to be lonely. Loneliness can sometimes be worse than any disease. I mentioned a number of times when you read, for example, the book of Lamentations, Echa. The first thing Jeremiah the prophet, the first thing he says when he witnesses the destruction of the first temple, he doesn't talk about the destruction, he doesn't talk about the deaths, he doesn't talk about the expulsion and the exile and the torture and all that. He says, Echa Yashva Badad, alas, that she sits alone. The loneliness of Jerusalem was more painful to him than anything else. Because without, when a person has friends and has companions, we can get through anything. But when you feel isolated and alone, then you don't feel the strength to get through things. So child, the, the pain is pain. And, we, and there are many difficulties in life. But, but, but loneliness weakens the person's resolve companionship, friendship, you have others that care about you, gives you strength. So to say just introspection, just introvert, no, that cannot be the case. So the first half of Hillel's statement negates being total extrovert, which means I have to be for myself. And the second negates being a total introvert. If I'm only, if I'm only for myself, what will I, if I'm by myself, what will I be? So if you think of it that way, and I did a little research, I wanted to see extrovert, introvert in modern culture, and I realized that all that I just described is not even talked about. Right away, every easily categorized people, look, this is an extrovert personality, this is a, the arguments are what defines extrovert? Some say it could be an introvert personality can sometimes look like an extrovert, extrovert can look like an introvert. 
And I'm not negating the fact that there's, that there's a leaning. We all have something, and we'll get to that soon. But this idea, this nuance, which is a lot more subtle and a lot more sophisticated, is that we all have both. And you, would, you can identify when you look for it. Unfortunately, what happens in life is we're sometimes forced to be someone we're not. Like for many of us, we, we, we cease to be the introvert because we're not comfortable there. I know people, personally, that talk to me, that come for, to, for counseling or I come to this class and tell me, I'm terrified. I remember I had one person, I said, there was a couple, they were just married. So I said, do you ever spend time with each other? Because every night they had money and they would party and they went every night, every night another restaurant, you know, New York, you could spend 100 years and every night have another place to go eat. So, no, they're always out. They're always doing things. So I said, every, any downtime, you ever just sit? And we really explored, you know what it came down? They're both terrified of being alone with each other. Why? Because they saw relationships around them that were very painful. Both of them had parents that did not know how to communicate, a lot of fighting, and they're afraid of that type of just being vulnerable with each other. So they have all kinds of distractions, smoke screens. Here's a party, here's a wedding, here's we're traveling, here we go eat. So their whole introverted element, the healthy being introvert, being introvert, I mean introspective, sit down, think about things, they are afraid to go there. So many people hide behind their activities. I'm so busy, I don't have time to, for myself. Well, some people, it's not that you don't have time. You don't want to have time because you're afraid what you're going to find. And you're afraid of, of meeting yourself, meeting yourself. And I mean that literally, meeting who you really are. So you have all these things to keep you busy. Now, there's also the other extreme. People who are afraid of everybody else and they just stay alone, isolated all the time. The fact of the matter is, a healthy human being needs to be partial introvert, partial extrovert. That's the revelation that you don't find, as I said, in other schools of psychology because they, don't really have, they haven't come to realize that. Now, I'm not saying this has never been said by anybody, but definitely not developed into a whole approach. Now, let's talk about leaning. Now, obviously, everything in life, let someone say to you, are you a cerebral person or an emotional person? Do you make decisions based on emotions or based on intellect? Now, we all have our leaning. Some people are very intuitive and very emotional. They, React, they, 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 they base things on their instincts. Others are very cerebral, very calculated. They won't let their emotions into play. It's not even an appropriate question, to be honest. I would never pray, phrase that question that way. It's a good question. To, it's a good conversation piece and maybe a good pickup line. But if you really want to think about it, the real question is not that. The question is we all have a mind and a heart. To say that one person is completely cerebral and another person is completely emotional is ridiculous. I wouldn't say ridiculous, there are people that escape there, but it's not the healthy balance. A healthy human being needs partial emotions and partial cerebral. However, you could say some people are more cerebral and less emotional, and others are more emotional and less cerebral. That's what you can say. And even that, you have to determine, is that who you really are, or that's just the tools you've developed? Because some people are great at hiding behind the mind games. I know people, they have an excuse for anything. You'll never get them anywhere because they are actually very fragile, very vulnerable, and very insecure. And how do they hide? They hide behind their mind. They can explain anything. And they can manipulate anyone with their minds. Any of you know such people? I know many such people. And if you say to them, you know, you're just an insecure little child hiding behind a big computer, they are obviously going to give you very big reasons how, how you're so wrong. Obviously. And that, so therefore, the fact that some people use their mind a lot doesn't necessarily mean that they're more cerebral. It just means that's the tool they use to cover their tracks, you know, to put it bluntly. Now, so how do you determine what is the healthy person and what is not? Well, firstly, if you're an honest person and you're really looking for the truth, not just to be right or not just to feel good about yourself, then you have to be open to hear some things you may not like to hear. Like a person like this that hides behind their mind, to be very honest, is going to have very difficulty in, good, in relationships. How will they ever really have a healthy marriage? Well, they don't want to even ever be vulnerable. Never admit the mistake. Always feel the other person is a problem. And always have a good excuse with the mind. And remember, the mind is brilliant. The mind can do anything, can find an answer for anything. You can justify the killing of six million Jews with the mind if you're pure cerebral. You know, where's the room for empathy? 
On the other hand, many of us do our emotions take hold, our, our control us. I would see probably majority of people that make decisions based on emotions. And that too, how do you find the balance? That's why it's critical to have a measure of humility and look for the healthy template of who you really are. And this takes really, I'm, it's really, I'm digressing a bit, but not completely, so I'll just mention this briefly. What is the dilemma? How can you really discover who you are as opposed to what you're doing? And I don't just mean your job, meaning the projected identity that you have versus your true identity. So you have to first identify, and I'll identify three factors that come into play that, that make a person be somebody who they're really not. In other words, you're born a certain way. Let's think of that as like freshly fallen snow. Yes, you have a genetic makeup that comes from your parents. No problem with that. But then life takes over. What are the three key factors that shape a person's life? Three forms of subjectivity. They are number one, personal bias. You develop personal biases and prejudices and personal way of looking at things. So that can block you. Why? Because self-love distorts your way of thinking. You know, you're suddenly think that your way is better than everyone else's way simply because you're subjective in that fashion. So that's a self, it's a natural self-blind spots that all of us have. We all have that natural biases. Again, that's not bad when you recognize it. It's bad when you don't recognize it. I'll get back to that in a minute. Second thing that, that can distort a person's identity or personality is parental influences. Attitudes your parents projected on you. To give extreme example, just to make the, drive the point home. You come home from school. You feel good about what you just studied. But your father is always berating you. Everything is critical. And your mother's quiet. And, and even when you're proud of what you just did, your father starts knocking you and starts saying, no, you're just a disappointment. I'm using, of course, an extreme example. I mean, this happens day after day. What do you think happens to the child? This enthusiastic, bubbly, jovial child suddenly becomes afraid because they know that father is going to criticize and therefore stops, starts repressing their feelings and is not so excited about things. Basically, the parent, the critical parent, is undermining and invalidating a child's natural excitement and enthusiasm. At some point, the child starts changing and adjusting to satisfy that parent. And all that natural self-confidence and self-esteem that this child deserved was, was robbed from it. it, did, it it's not lost but it goes undercover. This is not uncommon what I just described. I gave us an extreme example. Some of us have it more milder. Some of us have, to have it even worse, abuse. So a normal child who's growing up and was going to have a healthy parents, with what do they do? They validate, they nurture, they water, they, they cultivate, they, they, they reinforce the child's view and, and give it confidence to explore, yes, that's beautiful, try again, even if the child fails, you don't just jump on the child. You help the child grow through failure, learn from your mistakes. What does that do? It infuses the child with the confidence. So parental influence is a tremendous effect of how we will adjust our personalities and maybe wander away from who we naturally are to what the environment of our parents have, has created. And this can go, as I said, the terrible way. It could also go in a good way. And finally, the third factor is social influences your friends, peer pressure, media, the things you see, the things you think will make you feel acceptable by others. And there too, you can suddenly start doing things that your natural instinct would never do, but everybody does it. So you don't want to be unpopular. You don't, you don't stand out as being different. So social, parental, and, and personal biases are three factors that play into every person's life because we all have all three. Nobody is immune. The difference between someone who grows into a healthy human being and one who doesn't is not because we have, the, the person doesn't have biases, because they're aware of it. It's like the, I asked once a fellow who came to see me, I said to him, and he was a brilliant guy, he had an excuse for everything, like I mentioned, and I said to him, he was, he's looking to get married, and he says every, nothing's working. He wants to know if there's a curse on him or something. <clears throat> well, I said to him, uh, sir, by his name I said, do you have any blind spots? I, was, I knew what he was going to answer. I was sure I knew what he was going to answer. And he answered. He says, no. Uh, he says, yes, but I know what they are. So I said, I smiled. I said, so they're blind spots. You know what they are. That's like the doctor that tells you, I'll tell you when you need a second opinion. 
That's not what you want. A second opinion is a second opinion. That's not to tell the doctor to tell him. Because you want to make sure the doctor didn't miss something. So the doctor is going to tell you, I'll tell you when I miss something. Uh, not really. That's not exactly how you verify uh, facts. That's what's called circular uh, journalism, as is being now in the headlines. That, you know, you verify your own thing. What's your source? I'm the source. Say, but I want to have an independent source. I'll tell you when you need an independent source. You get the idea. So I smiled. He says, why are you smiling? I said, because a blind spot means it's a blind spot. Not that you know what they are. And uh, he wouldn't admit it. He just wouldn't accept it. Fine, so good. I couldn't help him. You can't help someone that's not helping themselves. The point I'm making here is all of us have these three forms of so-called dis possible distortions or biases. The difference is, are you acknowledging it? If you acknowledge it, you'll do something about it. What, what does that mean? If I know that I personally can have a bias because it's about me or about my friend or my brother or sister, I'll go to an objective party and say I need an objective opinion because I am not sure that I'm right. That's the first healthy thing a human being does to verify. Now, if you don't want to hear something that you, if you don't want to hear you're wrong, obviously you're not going to do that. But which intelligent person is going to do that? You're going to go buy a house and say, oh, you know what, I don't need a lawyer, I don't need a, I don't need a bank, I'm going to do it on my own. Go, good luck. Most people will understand, because there it's not so emotional. You understand, you need a lawyer, you need a bank, you need a loan, you need whatever it needs. You're going to go build a building. Say, I want to have a, a five-story mansion. You don't know a thing about contracting, you don't know a thing about architecture. You're going to start building it? Every intelligent person says, I've got to hire someone that knows it. When it comes to our personal issues, it gets more, it's much more touchy and much more sensitive because we don't want to acknowledge necessarily. So these three biases is what blocks us to really find out what we're like. If you can get through them, then you can begin to discover the real you. The real you, independent of these three influences, will then tell you whether you're leaning to being more extrovert or more introvert. Because I can assure you that most of us are one or the other not because that's who we naturally are. It's most likely because of the forces of life, the three factors that I just said, that drove you in that direction. Now, I'm not going to say absolutely, because there's no question that we also have a natural side to things, what we really made up. But the problem is we don't know. How do you know what's natural, what's not? You know? So it's really coming to terms to discovering yourself and discovering these two forces inside of you and realizing that you need to have a balance. And yes, once you have the balance, you'll realize that some things you're, more, you're stronger at than in others. Like some people are very clearly better to sit quietly in a room to analyze, to, um, to uh, dissect, to research. More of a very introverted approach. Others are excellent at pitching it or selling it to someone else. You'll see many good marketing firms or advertising firms, or PR firms, or even lawyer, even legal firms. You'll find there's the back-end excellence and there's the front-end. Darwin and Huxley. Hmm? Darwin and Huxley. Okay, right. What's the back-end? For example, the person who writes a press release is usually more of a research writer type. The person who gets on the phone to pitch the press release is usually much more of a, a socialite, someone that can connect to another person. Sometimes the good writers are not necessarily the best ones to sell even their own writing. You all know the study of Carl Reiner. Carl Reiner was one of the first TV producers. He basically is the father and creator of the sitcom, you know, the half hour or hour show that is now so popular, whether it's drama or comedy or whatever it may be. Carl Reiner in the 60s, brilliant writer, wealthy, wrote what was called one of the early sitcoms, was called one of the early com com comedies, the Dick Van Dyke Show. Okay? Before my time either, so it's not evidence of how old I am. Okay, but I read the story. It's very, it was very intriguing. He, read, he wrote, this, wrote the script, and of course now you have to choose actors who's going to play the script. So he, who acted, decided he's going, to be the, he's going to be the main character. Now he wrote the character, so he knows it well, and he thought he would present it best. And when, he, when they first piloted it, and they had the, whatever, the test audiences, what do they call them? These, uh, you know, huh? Yeah, yeah, you have the, it's like a test audience. Focus group. Focus group, that's the word. They, when they, they, they saw it, it's unanimous, or most of them said, you're not the right actor for it. It's a brilliant part and brilliant writing, but you're not the right actor. Now he was in control. 
He could do whatever he wants. He could have said, I don't care what you say, I want to do it, and that's that. But he was smart enough and humble enough. And maybe, maybe even, maybe it wasn't humility. Maybe he wanted success more than being the actor. He went out to search and they found Dick Van Dyke. That's why it's called that show. Dick Van Dyke was the actor and the show became one of the biggest, the first one of the biggest hits. <clears throat> the model for so many other comedies that came later. Because he understood that though he wrote it and though he, he, he fabricated, he basically created it from scratch. Someone else <clears throat> was better at acting the part that he wrote than he himself could. That's an understanding that you realize that success is not dependent. You don't have to do everything. You have to just know what you're good at and let someone else do the other thing. Some people feel that they have to be the extrovert because they, for some reason, convinced those were the success stories in their lives. And there's some people who think the other way around. So it's just an example of this, um, of, this, of, of this approach. And you'll find this, I remember in writing, when you write, I remember my agent, my literary agent told me, you know, I asked him, what's the real definition of a good editor? There's the writer, there's the editor. Everybody needs an editor. So some arrogant writers say editors are failed writers. So that's where they go into editing. Since they can't write, they only come to edit and criticize other writers. Okay, I didn't really feel that way. So he told me a very interesting definition. He said, an editor is someone that takes your writing and writes it better in your voice than you could have written it. Not someone who writes a new voice. That's not an editor. That's a new writer. Someone that writes your voice better than you could have written. And I realized that same idea, that uh, the strength. But you need to be confident and secure and need to be ready to hear that. So to go back or sum up what I was saying is that we all have the extrovert, introvert in us from birth. Both are necessary in life. And you see it in the Hillel's words. You see it in all of Jewish tradition. You see, for example, in the morning, you wake up. <clears throat> the first thing we do is we prayers. Then some study or the, or the other way around. <clears throat> and then you go out to work. So you begin like Yaakov, Ishtam Yoshev Ahalim, study, prayer. And then you, like the Esau that goes out, the warrior, and we're talking about in a kosher good way, into business, into the work. Every week, we have six days of the week where we go out to work. And we have one Shabbos where we go in, back to home, back into our natural selves, our souls, a more soulful experience. And this balance is necessary for every human being in life. We all need the time where we go more internal and times we go more external. And the balance is when you're able to balance the two perfectly, which is effort, but you have to be able to understand these two elements. A person that is just out there and doesn't have time to plan, doesn't have time to introspectively look at something, evaluate it, properly um, do that, is not going to succeed fully. And someone that just is introspective and just plans all day and doesn't implement and execute is also not going to be complete. And there's many other manifestations of this in many different ways. And we have to always look at ourselves and say, which part of us is, what are we doing right now? What are you, where, you, where are you more active in? Which world, the introversion, introvert or the extrovert? See if it's in a balanced way. And then try to see what you're like if you strip away the three biases I mentioned as much as possible and see what are you like not in the environment of your parents, not in the environment what society demands, and somewhat get an objective opinion by asking another person because you yourself may be biased. And I guarantee you, do the, do the suggested things I just, I just the, idea, the exercises I just suggested, you'll find things about yourself you'd be surprised. Because there's always dimensions to us that we're not aware of. As, as self-aware as a person is, there's always more. Because we don't know what's lying beneath the surface. You only know what you know. You don't know what you don't know. So if someone to say, you know, I, did, I once did a uh, little survey. I can't call it a scientific survey, but I asked around 100 people, maybe more, of different ages, from young childhood to all the way to the 90s, men and women, Jewish and not Jewish, of all different persuasions. And my question was, in percentage, in a ratio form, in percentage form, how much do you know of yourself? 100% would be, I know everything about myself there is to know. Zero would be, I know nothing about myself. And this, the, the results were fascinating. No matter, what, no matter what persuasion, no matter what denomination, no matter what religion, culture, gender, it was all dependent on the age. 
the younger the age, obviously the five-year-old was not capable of understanding such a question. So I think I started 11, 12 maybe. The younger the age, the more the percentage, the higher the percentage. 13, 14-year-olds were saying, I know 70, 80% of myself, once I explain the question, and by the time I'm 30, 40, I'll know 100% or 99%. The higher the age, the percentage is reverse. Someone 20 years old starts saying 40%, 30%. Someone 50 years old says 20%. The 90-year-old, not one, they said, I don't know, maybe 1%. And I say, how do you explain that? They say, because the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. Because how do I know? How could I answer this question? You could only say, if you knew, for example, what's inside this hidden closet, you could say, okay, we revealed 10%. But if you don't even know what's inside, how could you say 10%? Maybe you don't even know 1%. How do you know what we carry and potential we carry inside ourselves? It's a very humbling exercise because you suddenly realize, one second, that's a good point. How much of your brain do you use? Some, no one really has an answer. Because they only have an answer if you knew the full capacity. When it comes to a hard drive and your computer, you could say, okay, five, uh, what are they today? Uh, not five. What's after gigs? The T with the T. Um, uh, terabytes. Terabyte. Five terabytes. Ten terabytes. Five gig. A hundred gig. Whatever. Megabytes. Kilobytes. Whatever it is you want. So you could say the computer has maximum memory of five um, terabytes. And then you reach the place where the computer says, no more memory. Very clear. So if you have 30%, it's 30% of five terabytes. But how many terabytes in the brain? Tell me how many ideas you think can fit in your brain. Do you think anyone's figured that out yet? No. Because no, no one has a clue. Because there's many ideas that are fit into our brain. You could always fit more. No one has ever come to a point where your brain tells you, hey, all the red lights go off. No more room for ideas. You know anyone that's ever complained and told you that? So we don't even know the potential that we have, the capacity that we have. That's why it's so vital to have friends and people that believe in you and don't take no for an answer. And there's no such thing as impossible because you cannot say impossible if you don't know your capacity. Now, I understand. Most of us understand that you cannot lift up 10 tons. We all have a limit of what we can lift. I'm not talking about that physical limit. But when you talk about emotional, psychological, and intellectual capacity, we are far, far, cl not close to our limits. That's why there's so much more to learn about oneself. And these exercises, the things I've been discussing, are great tools, I believe, to help a person get to that place. So on a final note, I'll say this. Um, in my own little experience in life, people I meet, my own observations, you find um, that every human being you meet has unbelievable, much more strengths and, and potential and beauty than they even know. Thank God I've been blessed to be able to um, see that. And it's a great thing to see because I know people who see other people, they always see the negative in everyone. They see how little you can do. You know, and they're always great to remind you, don't, think you, don't get your hopes up. Who do you think you are? So it's great to be able to look at people and be able to see that a soul's capacity is far more beautiful, more powerful than even you yourself may ever know. And seeing that gives you a lot of strength because it helps you uh, give you confidence in people. And then the question is, how do you help people get to that place? Like, let's put it the way Michelangelo said it. Michelangelo said it when he was asked, how do you carve those beautiful angels out of marble? He was a, uh, a sculptor and uh, an artist. So his answer was a brilliant answer. He said, I see the angels trapped in the marble. And I carved and carved and set them free. So most people think, no, his brilliance was that he knew how to create an angel. He says, no, the angel was there. All I needed to do was get rid of the excess. The lesson of that is that we all are those angels and we all are those flowers and all have that music. But then there are things that grow on us, like weeds in a garden, layers, concrete, marble, other substances that block and don't let us access that uh, potential we have. So it's a critical component is to learn how to recognize that there's that, those angels and then do what is necessary to get rid of the excess, the, the sideshows, the means to be able to let that shine. And very often we are our own worst enemies because we don't believe in ourselves. and We buy into the myth that other people tell us that weaken our resolve and our self-confidence. 
So in seeing that, when you see that, when you see it, you see both both sides, the, the beauty of what people can be, and sometimes the pain of what people think they are. And it can be very uh, disturbing when you see it very clearly, because you see, wow, look at this person, such great potential, but they're so far away because they think they can't do it. And it's an excellent way of looking at things. Sometimes, put it simplistically, I tell people, okay, tell me, you're part of the problem or you're part of the solution? It's critical to want to see yourself as part of the solution. Too many people are part of the problem. Part of the problem means you reinforce all these negative stuff. Being hopeless, sensing resignation, all these factors that we can, we can resolve, demoralization. And it's vital to be a person that feels you're part of the solution. That doesn't mean it's all solved. It just means you're growing toward the solution. And the solution is what? Is the solution is that self-awareness and recognizing these different forces in our lives, the extrovert, introvert, and, and using it, actualizing it, actualizing it in, our, in every possible way. So in a way you can say, in a way our mission, our collective mission, is to help each other see that clear. As I said before, we're one grand symphony. Every one of us is an indispensable musical note and can only be complete when we all play the music together. But we also have to have confidence in our own voice, in our own music. And that's the challenge, is to find, help people find that voice and then help them see how they complement and others complement them. So I want to wish you all that you should be able to um, find and discover these tools. I hope for some of the, the classes that I give here, all the classes I give, is tries to go in that direction and the empowering tools and skills to be able to discover these parts of yourself. And then, of course, most importantly, actualize it because we're sent to this world to fulfill a mission. And each one of us has our indispensable mission that you and only you can accomplish, period. So it would be very sad if a person lose, goes through their lives and doesn't even, is not even aware of it and doesn't actualize. So my blessing to everybody this week is the, every week, but this week as well, is to find that part of yourself, the introvert within you, the extrovert within you. Make sure they know how to dance together. They complement each other because they both need each other and uh, to live a very blessed week and a blessed life. So it's a pleasure to, to speak to you a few words this week. I read it again? Okay, we'll read the dedication again. And, um, and uh, then we go every week, Wednesday, 8.30 till approximately now. Those of you who have not been here before, online or in the class, MeaningfulLife.com, full array of uh, resources in this uh, spirit. And I want to again say the class was sponsored by Judith Kirk, in memory of her brothers, Kalman Mordechai ben David Elio, Benish Getzel ben David Elio, and her father, David Elio ben Avram Yitzchak, in honor of the birthdays of Yafir Rezel, Bas Teva, and the Vida Batsheva Bas Yehudit Pearl. Okay. Everyone be blessed. Have a very beautiful week. And I look forward to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.